The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion on some of the major glossaries in ProCloud. My name is Brad, and I'll be hosting the demonstration today. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions pane under Go to Webinar panel. If the question is outside of the scope of today's discussion, please email them to support at designmanager.com. And lastly, if you miss a portion of the webinar or want to review any of our past discussions, go to our YouTube channel at Design Manager Inc., Design Manager INC. And here you can see a complete listing of all sorts of topics, including quick start videos, short helpful tutorials, and all of our comprehensive webinars, which we categorize into our project management courses, accounting courses, and all of our weekly webinars as well. Okay. So, glossaries are used throughout ProCloud to maintain data consistency and accuracy, to apply various defaults and settings, and much more. You can access a glossary wherever you see a smart search on a screen in ProCloud. Let's use the, pro the project window as an example. So, I'm going to go to my projects. I'm going to click Add. And notice I can see several areas for a smart search. First is the client. I also have one on my sales tax code, my designer or manager, shipping location, etc. So how can you use these? Well, if I want to access this search or access a glossary, the client as our example, I can just start typing. If I know the client's name, such as Hilson, I start typing and then I'll find all of the selections that match that particular set of characters. I can also use the arrow next to the smart search, which brings up our client search window, which is very similar to the glossary as we'll see momentarily. And lastly, I can use the search button in the bottom left corner if my cursor is highlighted in the smart search field. And again, we'll bring up the client search window in this case. So that's how we're going to access our glossaries uh, on various windows uh, in Design Manager. So let's begin with our glossaries that are listed on our project tab. And you can see them under the list in glossaries frame as shown here. <laughs> now, many of these uh, various glossaries are covered in their own previously recorded discussions and are going to much greater detail there. Let me point out some of those so you can review them uh, in greater depth in those various other discussions, such as the catalog. That can be found under creating catalog items in ProCloud. Our specification templates are covered in detail under our bid specification and spec sheet documents webinar. Time activities and employees are covered at length in many webinars, such as our time billing webinar, and you can see both of the glossaries listed there. And finally, even on our accounting tab, we have a smaller set of listed glossaries, but our sales tax codes and sales categories are covered in our setting up sales tax codes and sales categories and component types explained respectively. So I won't go into detail on those particular glossaries because they've been explained at length in all those various other areas. So I'll go into some of the other uh, glossaries that are not covered in their own uh, presentations. Okay. Though all glossaries have tremendous value, some such as uh, the vendor and client glossaries are utilized more frequently. So let's begin there, starting with our vendor glossary. So all I have to do to access the vendor glossary is simply click on the vendors button, and there we go. Now, on the vendor glossary window, we're showing several columns uh, to keep everything nice and tight and easily accessible as possible. Just a note here about most of our glossaries in general. You can sort by, any, by nearly any column simply by clicking the column head heading. I can see I'm sorted by vendor code because I have a little double arrow facing to the right in this case. If I wanted to sort by vendor name, 
I just click the vendor name column and you can see I'm sorting now by vendor name and I'm doing so in in, these, uh, in ascending order, in other words, from A to Z. If I click the vendor name column heading again, notice very slightly the arrows now point to the left and I'm going in descending order, in other words, from Z to A. If I wanted to search for a particular vendor, just start typing. So if I wanna go down to, I don't know, Kravit, if I start typing KRA, boom, Design Manager is automatically gonna compress the vendor glossary to show in only those vendors that satisfy the characters I've typed. You can also, on most any grid in Design Manager, right click and export. So if I wanted to pull uh, my vendor glossary and export it into a uh, Excel or Google Sheets uh, version, an XLS file, a XLSX file, I could do so just by right clicking and selecting the export another handy feature available for you as well. Okay, our vendor glossary has an additional feature on it that's often unknown to many of our design manager users, and that's the vendor status window. Let's take Century Furniture as an example. I'm gonna highlight them on my vendor glossary, and I'm going to click the status button, which brings us to our vendor status status screen. And it's actually split into two areas. We have a summary area and we have a detail area as well. On the summary, we can see all of the information for this vendor in a quick snapshot. I can see all of my open purchase orders. I can see the current vendor deposits that I've sent that I've not yet applied on vendor invoices. In other words, an open vendor deposit. The future due is the difference of those two values. I can see all the vendor invoices I've, I've, I've recorded the application of any deposit, and the net invoice as well. The total payable is gonna be all the bills and deposits that I've recorded for the vendor so far. In other words, the open vendor deposits and the net invoices. I can even see my current accounts payable, in other words, all the unpaid bills I have, any payables that I have on hold or waiting for payment, my year-to-date purchases, and my prior year-to-date purchases as well as time goes on. Very nice handy snapshot of all that information for us. The details screen will simply show all that information in each transaction. I can then use my type selection to show only certain types of transactions. I wanna focus on deposits or, or vendor invoices or checks, I can do so. I can see the detail of those particular transactions if I wanted to using the detail button. And very conveniently, provided I have the proper permissions, I can use my go to button and actually bring up that transaction on its applicable window. In this case, I'm jumping right to our vendor invoicing window existing tab so I can see that vendor invoice itself for greater detail. Very handy window um, for all of your vendor information needs, taking all of the consolidated vendor transactions and putting it into a nice simple interface for you. Okay, vendor status window. Now, let's take uh, one of our vendors and uh, look and see what all the information is available for us on the vendor window itself. Let's start with our curtain calls workroom. I'm gonna click the edit button. Now, I can double click, I could click the edit button, or I could even hit the enter key. Any of those three ways would bring up the vendor that I have selected. Let's start on the vendor window on the information tab. First, we have our unique code in Design Manager for the vendor itself. We have the name, obviously, and the sorting capability. Now for vendors, the sorting capability defaults to company. In other words, I'm just gonna simply use my sorting mechanism as whatever I've typed into the, comp, uh, to the, the, to the vendor name. The name selection actually is applicable for an individual's names, Mr. Robert Johnson, et cetera and I can even manually import my sorting as well. All of that is really doing is going to determine what name appears or what order the name appears on the vendor name window. For most vendors, it's going to be company. We'll see that contrasted with another glossary later on. Next to that, we have two ways to classify the vendor. We have the type and we have the category. Now, I found it sufficient only 
to use the category where I'm breaking out my vendors into very generic subdivisions, furniture, bedding, operating, workrooms, et cetera. I could then use the type to further subdivide those particular uh, categories or vice versa. I could use the type as the greater uh, sorting mechanism and the category to uh, further give definition of the various types. All of that is completely up to you. I just always focus on having consistent and unique information filled in. And for my team, just putting in the category is sufficient. It really gives me the ability to narrow the uh, vendors I'm looking for on the vendor uh, glossary window or other certain reports. Types and categories, very handy. Next, we have uh, the address, of course, of the vendor, city, state, and zip. Uh, notice from here as well that I do have an option to click on the search button in the bottom left corner when I'm in the vendor address field. And if I do so, Design Manager will go ahead and pull up that address for you very conveniently, and you can get your directions and those types of things. The contact at the vendor um, for us to uh, get in touch with, the phone number of that contact, fax if applicable these days, the uh, employer identification number or the EIN of the vendor. That's going to be uh, necessary if you do need to send a 1099 for the vendor as we'll discuss a little bit later on. The our account number with our vendor. I can enter that here and I have the option to include that account number on any checks we send to the vendor as well. So if we put the account number in, we might as well have it printed on the check as well uh, to ensure that payment is properly um, attributed to our company. Then we have some additional information. Email, of course, uh, for the individual to receive emails or the company to receive email is very handy if I want to send a purchase order via email, et cetera. I have additional areas for the website of the company if desired and additional phone numbers I could use. I have uh, our contact, I have her cell phone number. So the description of phone two applies to phone number two, as would phone three description apply to the phone number three as well. The create ship to option, a little handy feature that's unknown to many in design manager. There could be certain circumstances where you may have an entity that's both a vendor and a shipping location. In fact, a workroom such as Curtain Calls is a perfect example. I could be using Curtain Calls as the vendor to uh, fabricate my uh, window treatments or pillows or what have you, but they may also be a shipping location for my other vendors to send fabric or trim or what have you. So if I need to create a shipping location from an existing vendor, I would just create the create ship to button and design manager will craft a ship to code for us. As we have seen, I have done in the past already for curtain calls, a very handy feature to uh, keep your coding consistent between the vendor and the shipping location and uh, to um, prevent you from having to re-enter all the information of the address, contact, et cetera. Another address for our vendors is our payee address. Now, I have my vendor address selected as my payee address as well. The vendor address is going to be used, obviously, for uh, purchase orders, etc. Now, when I'm writing checks or other documents, I may have a different address for those to go. Sometimes vendors may have a third-party company doing all of their accounts payable, or they have a PO box for that type of information, or they're a larger conglomerate and they have a, a centralized payment uh, office in Minnesota or whatever, where all checks go to. In that case, I want I would unselect the vendor uh, as payee option, and I can then allow the two addresses <clears throat> to diverge. This would also appear on your 1099s. This is gonna be the address on the check, as I said, et cetera. If the vendor, if the use vendor as payee is selected, you can see that that information is disabled. And if I do make any changes in the vendor address, let's say I change our eight to a nine, you can see it's automatically reflected for me in the payee address to keep those two addresses always synchronized. Very handy. 
Further to the right, we have some additional information about that 1099. In the case that I do need to send a 1099 to curtain calls, if the name on, that should be presented on the 1099 is different than the payee name, I could input it into the recipient name field as shown here. So they have a different legal name for their LLC. Finally, beneath that is the 1099 designation. Essentially, where does the uh, cost appear on the 1099 document? Very frequently, it would be in the non-employee um, uh, area, but it could also be for rents or attorney or even interest. So by selecting the appropriate uh, type of 1099 <clears throat> format, Design Manager will automatically put the uh, dollar amount in the proper field on the document. Okay, lots of um, settings and interesting features on the information tab of the vendor window. Let's jump over now to the defaults screen and see what's afforded to us here. Starting off, we have the purchase order terms. This will automatically appear on the purchase order documents for you to indicate the, the terms you have established with the vendor, net 30, net 15 upon receipt, whatever it may be. So once it's entered here, it'll automatically appear for you on the purchase order document. Same with the purchase order ship via. I use TBD as an example. If I don't have any uh, particularly um, pre-scheduled shipping decisions with the vendor, so I can have that entered and change it on the purchase order. But again, by having it set for a default, it's a reminder for me to set up some shipping or those types of things. And once it is on the vendor, I don't have to enter it again further down the road on the purchase order itself. <clears throat> Beneath the ship view and the terms is our deposit information. Does the vendor require a prepaid deposit to, pro to begin processing the order? In this case, Curtain Calls does at 50%. And beneath that, I can indicate to what types of um, goods and services should that 50% be applied? Well, they want it for any merchandise they're applying and since they are a uh, fabricator in a workroom, they want it on their installation uh, and labor as well. But they don't want it on other things such as freight that may cam come up or crating or what have you. So I can tell Design Manager what various component types should the 50% be applied. And that will default all the way down to your component window for you, so you don't need to remember to type it in, et cetera. Beneath that are the buying terms, if you have a contract with the vendor where they prevent, provided you with a series of terms or percentages that allow you to calculate your cost from their list price, they would be entered in on this window. And upon doing so, when you use this vendor, Design Manager will automatically apply those buying terms on the component window where you would simply input the list price and Design Manager would calculate the cost for you predicated on those terms. Beneath that, we have our early payment information. Curtain Calls is, is a, a vendor that will actually give me a discount if I pay via check within a certain amount of days. So they'll give me 2.5% off any bills if I pay them within five days of the payment days. All of these work in conjunction with one another. Let's take an example. I'm gonna hop over to my accounting tab and go to my payments and checks window. And right here, I have an invoice that I've recorded for curtain calls uh, just a few days back. Now, I have 30 days to pay, so I'm well within my payment due days and my days to take discount. So Design Manager notices that my original amount was $251.50. So it's taking 2.5% of that as a discount, which indeed is rounded to $6.29. So my current amount to pay is $245.21. So if your vendor does provide you with a, such a discount or you negotiate those terms, because many vendors will do so, Design Manager will automatically calculate those figures for you. As long as the vendor is configured properly, let Design Manager do all the math and remember to um, apply those discounts, et cetera. Another feature that I'm utilizing with my Curtain Calls workroom is my default markup percentages or my override pricing percentages. Design Manager allows you to use the vendor 
to override the pricing model that you may have configured for your projects. I have a 30% markup on all of my merchandise, uh, usually, and that will apply down to installation, et cetera, as well. But in the case of curtain calls, I want to override my markup at 40%. So rather than charging 30% that I usually do for my installation and labor, for this particular vendor, I always want to do 40%. And I could even change the pricing model if I wanted to, rather than just changing it from marking up to 30% to 40%, I could choose to discount off of list, particularly if I uh, uh, am repping a line for that vendor or what have you, or I could even create a fee pricing structure as well. So this is a way to override your pricing model at the vendor level. And the options to the right of the percentages themselves tell design manager where to apply that overridden um, pricing model. I can do it for project specifications with the top option and or I could do it uh, against inventory and catalog items as well. So we allow you to control uh, where that application of the override is going to be applied to all your project information, uh, all your project uh, components and or to your inventory and catalog prices as well as well. Okay. Now let's jump over to another vendor to explore some other defaults uh, that were, aren't so applicable to curtain calls. So if we go down to an operating vendor such as our energy or our gas and electric provider, I've configured some other defaults. Notably, I've input an expense account for me. Whenever I'm going to be paying NRG via an operating expense for the, the monthly gas and electric, I don't want to remember to use the 6,100, uh, 61,600 gas electric operating expense account. By inputting it singularly on my de uh, defaults tab of my vendor window, design manager will automatically use that account when I'm putting in operating expenses for our NRG vendor. That keeps my data entry rapid, uh, correct, uh, prevents mistakes, all of those types of things. Very handy feature, and I recommend doing that for all of my uh, operating expense vendors. Further, I can use the do not allow on specification stock items and purchase orders option. This will prevent any user from incorrectly selecting the NRG vendor on a component window. We're certainly not going to be purchasing any fabric or merchandise from our, uh, our gas and electric company. So by using that, um, the do not allow on specifications option, the, the user will be prevented from selecting that as the default vendor. Just a very nice check and balance that you can use within a design manager. Let's switch vendors one more time to focus on another final option on uh, the defaults tab of the vendor window. Let's go to one of our contractors, jump over to the defaults tab. And in this case, I'm using design managers insurance mechanism or functionality. Here, you can enter in insurance policies for your various vendors, particularly your contractors. You would select the policy type, general liability being uh, one of the primaries. You can optionally input the insurance carrier and policy number. That's really for your benefit. Keep all that information <clears throat> in one place for yourselves. If there's an, a date where the policy begins, you could optionally input that into the effective date. But what you really want to focus on is the expiration date. So we should always put that in uh, to our vendor insurance uh, record. Because any active insurance policies that have an expiration date prior to today's date, whenever I'm trying to import, uh, use the vendor, on a um, vendor invoice or a purchase order, et cetera, I'm gonna be warned when doing so. So design manager can be used to ensure that you're not inputting bills to vendors who don't have a valid insurance policy recorded, really keeping yourself abreast of uh, making sure that all of your uh, contractors, et cetera, do have valid insurance policies with the company. The concept of active, comes into place where 
um, you may have a, uh, a brand new policy that will be starting in, let's say, the, follow the, the next year coming, but it's not yet active. I want to input that information, but I want to leave the current policy as the active one. That's the designation with the active selection. So if your company is very, um, uses a lot of uh, contractors or vendors that do require insurance policies, that's a great way to keep that information right in your design manager in one uh, centralized area, plus have another check and balance within the uh, program to prevent you or to warn you that you're inputting bills against a vendor whose uh, current insurance has lapsed. Vendor insurance, very handy feature as well, and often an, um, an unknown feature for many of our design manager users out there. So lots of information and, and um, different settings we can use on our vendor window and vendor glossary in general. Let's jump over to another one. Go back to our project tab and equally as important or equally as utilized as the vendors is probably our client glossary. Now, I just have a few examples on ours to keep my list nice and tidy and manageable where I have the Carters and the Hilsons. Let's use the Hilsons as an example and see what type of information we have on our client window. Again, we're starting on our information screen and we'll see what other features are available for us here. We have our code, of course. Now, notice my name, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Hilson. Since I'm using the name option on my sort selection, Design Manager takes the surname, any given or birth names, and then the honorifics will all appear in parentheses at the back. Why? If every single of my clients were sorted by Mr. and Mrs., then on the client name, I would be only sorting with a bunch of M's out there. So by using Design Manager's advanced sorting capabilities, I'm having all of my surnames first so I can jump right down to the Hilsons uh, or the Martins or what have you. Just like our vendors have abilities for type and uh, category, our client does as well. If all of your clients are residential or all of your clients are commercial, you don't need to put a type in there. But if you do have various um, clients that have that maybe commercial, maybe nonprofit, um, you know, maybe it could be yachts or, air, or airplanes or what have you, and you do want to classify them, you can use the type selection to do so. The address information for the client is going to be the default project billing address when we create projects for our clients. So whatever the primary address is for the client to receive any, uh, any mailings, that should be the address listed. Of course, you can change that on a per project basis, but that will be defaulted from the client as we'll see in a little bit. And again, we have the same information, address, city, state, zip, contact, phone, fax, email, very handy, defaults down to the project so I can email uh, the Hilsons their proposals or invoices. Uh, website again, perhaps for commercial clients, that's more applicable. Additional phone numbers, very handy with clients. So I have both of the Hilsons uh, cell phone numbers available for myself. The designer associated with the particular um, client, this would again default down to the project level. Tax ID, uh, very handy. If it is a nonprofit or commercial uh, client, you may want to have that uh, information recorded uh, uh, conveniently within Design Manager. The invoice terms, that will also default down to each of the projects and will print, uh, uh, that will print right on the invoice document itself. I also have the ability to record finance charges in Design Manager, and ultimately it's, um, often configured at the client level. So I can input the monthly finance charge percentage and the number of days from the invoice date itself to apply that monthly finance charge. What does that mean? Let's take a example in action here. So we'll jump over to our accounting tab and I'll go to our client invoice window. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the uh, client invoice window and adding invoices to your client, but may have overlooked 
the Finance Charge button immediately to the right of the Add Invoice button. If I click on the Finance Charge button, it brings me to my jo uh, Generate Finance Charges window, and I can input some information here. The aging date is going to default <clears throat> to the end of the month, but it's going to be what we use to determine if the client's invoice has exceeded that finance charge number of days. And then I can either generate finance charges for all the clients with um, outstanding invoices using the information that we just filled in on the client glossary. I could also input uh, the finance charge percentage and days manually, but I may have certain terms with each of my clients, so I like to do it on a per client basis. And if I just click OK here, Design Manager goes out and immediately determines which invoices are outstanding over my um, the uh, uh, payment due dates, or the finance charge dates, and generates finance charge invoices for me. So I can then print and uh, except these, it'll list the invoices in question on the um, the finance charge invoice, and I can send it to the client as well. So if you are um, currently using finance charges for your vend for your clients to uh, get payment back on outstanding bills, Design Manager can do all that for you. And I have noticed that is becoming more common in the industry as of late. So. A very, uh, very handy feature in Design Manager, and again, one of those sort of uh, unknown or less utilized features that many uh, Design Manager Pro users are unaware of. Okay, beneath our finance charge information, we have the default sales tax code. Again, that will default down to uh, any new project for the particular client. Obviously, that can be changed as well. Okay, lots of information on our client window. Just as an example though, you can see all of that information and how it applies on our project window. When we select our client, all of that information that we just reviewed is automatically displayed for us. Again, the client address defaults to the billing address, my sales tax code is coming over, Mr. Wolf is the uh, principal designer, for all the uh, work with the Hilsons, et cetera. So if I configure my clients properly, all that information is gonna be used appropriately for me on my project window information tab, even my defaults tab where I have my invoice terms, et cetera, all comes along properly for us. Okay, client glossary. Let's take a look at some of our other glossaries now. Um, we have our location glossary. This location glossary is our company-wide location list. This is intended for more generic locations that can be used across multiple projects. They can easily be accessed when entering in specifications, even if the current project doesn't have the desired location. What do I mean by that? Well, we have our company-wide or global location lists. Let's go to our Hilson project. Now we can see we have locations for the wine cellar and the outdoor living area, but we're going to be entering in some specifications for, oh, I don't know, how about the master bedroom? I can easily see that I don't have any items with the master bedroom location, but when I'm entering them in, Click our add button, item for master bedroom. When I go into my location smart search and I just start typing master bedroom or master anything, I have my options for both the bathroom and the bedroom. It's pulling that automatically from my company wide listing as well. So I don't have to add it manually. I can simply select that particular location, enter in my sales category. And now, just like that, I've already created a master bedroom location in my Hilson Pocono home project as well. Very handy. Remember though that the uh, company-wide locations should be generic. Don't, when we're adding locations for a particular project, 
So back on a new item. If I went to add a custom location for this particular project, such as Brad's study, I would generally not want to use the update company wide list. If I did make that selection, I would then have a Brad's study in my company wide list. Mm, probably not going to be used across many projects. So generally, I would not want to do that. So be careful when you're adding your project specific locations, not to have that selected. So uh, they don't clutter up your much more tidy, nice, uh, nice uniform company wide list. Okay, locations. Next. How about our remarks glossary? This is an extremely convenient resource to quickly communicate standardized information to clients and vendors, um, creating information templates to ensure proper data uh, entry and, and other uses. So I have a few quick examples listed here. You can have as many as you possibly need, but it allows us to, like I said, quickly put in standardized information on documents such as our invoice. So if I was creating an invoice, let's use our Helson project since that's been a favorite so far. Grab a couple of items, but on my new invoice window, if I go to re my remarks area, here's my default project invoice remarks, fantastic. But I may want to convey more information. So if we notice, I can select my search button in the bottom uh, left corner and select my invoice, one of my invoice remarks. Just by clicking choose, Design Manager will then append that right where my cursor is. So I may have a series of various invoice um, remarks that can be added as applicable to the particular invoice itself. Since we're putting them into our remarks glossary, we're ensuring proper spelling, proper verbiage, the voice we want to have to our client. Uh, if I need to make any changes for uh, more legal terms and conditions, and those are some of my invoice uh, remarks, just changing them uniformly in the remarks glossary will then allow all of my new invoices where I need to use them to have that proper information. So rather than having to type everything manually, I have those standardized remarks for my invoice or for my proposal, et cetera. I have another one for uh, my purchase orders. Again, I could have as many purchase order remarks as I may, may need. And in that particular example, I'd be adding a purchase order, select some components. And if I wanted to add remarks here in the instructions um, of the purchase order, I could just click the edit button as indicated by the pencil, put in my special instructions, just like that. And again, I've seen many firms that have a multitude of various uh, purchase order instructions, they may want to be included into the special instructions field on the PO document, all depending on what's being ordered and any particulars about it as well. Great. Now, lastly, my third example is a description template. Let's see what I mean by that. Back on our Hilson project in our specifications. Oops. Go back to our item for our master bedroom. I may want certain information to always be recorded by all of the users of Design Manager, and it may depend on what type of uh, merchandise is being ordered or service. So right beneath my information of the description itself, again, I have access to my remarks glossary by clicking the search icon in the bottom left corner, and I'm going to select one of my item description templates. And now Design Manager puts in the information to ensure that my users are inputting exactly what I want. Have I entered in the item description? I did. 
And now I want to fill in the dimensions, style, finish, color, pattern, what have you. This way, we're creating standardized, uniform data entry, and we're ensuring we're communicating everything we want to our clients throughout the, um, throughout the company. So we're not missing particular information to communicate. We're creating very standardized, professional looking documents. Um, and everyone's adhering to the same standards. Very, very convenient and uniform way of doing so. Uh, uh, very, using the remarks glossary there in a very interesting way to, um, to standardize some of our data entry there. Okay, let's see. Lastly, we did talk about uh, employees. I did note that they are um, discussed at length, particularly in the case of time billing because uh, costs, rates to the, the client, et cetera, are configured in conjunction with the employee and time activities and other settings. We'll leave that to the time building webinars as I, show, as I displayed at the beginning of our discussion. But there is a few pieces of information I wanted to show here that are often uh, unknown or underutilized. Let's edit Ashley momentarily. And on her information tab, we do have the all of her address information, phone number, et cetera, email, but I have the default purchase order designer extension. What does this do? Well, whenever I'm making a new project, if I have Ashley as the associated designer, I'm going to default that information into my project purchase order designer extension. What this does is that information will appear in the header of all of your project purchase orders for this particular project. That way, the vendor knows who to contact at the company about these particular orders. So the vendor doesn't call or email and say, hey, I have this order for the uh, Hilson's Mountain House and I don't know who to talk to. This circumvents much of that, that, that confusion. And it, it can be customized on an employee basis because the employee is gonna be the one fielding all those particular questions. Even perhaps if you have a, um, a centralized uh, individual or individuals who handle uh, order tracking and order questions for all vendors, putting their information into this um, PO designer field as well, again, eliminates some of that confusion that can inevitably arise. So that's one piece on the uh, employee glossary. Some other information, uh, we talked about time, of course, is the point of sale and showroom information. This gives the employee access to the design manager point of sale system. So Ashley can then log in to the point of sale system and record sales from clients walking in if your company um, uh, has such a service available. The commission percentage ties directly in to the accounts receivable commission report. That's going to be a listing of all invoices that Ashley, Ashley was associated with uh, within a given fiscal time frame, and her percentage of commission will be calculated from the commission percentage on her employee window. Again, if your company does such um, transactions. The default warehouse or showroom and the default sales tax code are used exclusively for the design manager point of sale system. If you don't have walk-in sales, you don't need to worry about it. Along with the ability to allow invoice date changes and to allow manual uh, price edits. All of which, again, is uh, uh, utilized under the accounting tab, the point of sale option, where Ashley uses her employee code to log in. Notice I can change my receipt date and fiscal month because she's configured as such. Can go in. The other features would be When inputting 
items. US sale. Does she have the ability to change the price, quantity, and discount, which she does based upon the settings on her employee window? So all of that uh, granting of the ability to generate point of sale invoices and how much freedom and um, authority she has to make changes, all configured from the employee window itself. Okay. And with that, that brings us to the end of our discussion on uh, several of the glossary windows in Design Manager that aren't covered in depth in other webinars, such as our client glossary, vendor glossary, uh, the remarks glossary, and to a degree, locations and employees as well. I hope to bring out some features of, uh, of these glossaries in ProCloud that really can be used to increase your efficiency, to provide advanced customizations, to um, enhance your standardization of data entry, and much more. With that, I thank everyone for joining the discussion today, and I hope you attend another of our free webinars in the near future. Take care and have a great day.